Hey everyone, uh, my name is Rhiannon and I'm working with eAgronom. Uh, thank you to Simon for that overview of the footprint, our farm footprint. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit more about company, company level footprints and why they're suddenly starting to look at farmers as a way, as a tool to reduce their footprint. Um, my specialisation at eAgronom is uh, talking to food companies and helping them design ways to uh, reduce their emissions. Uh, so I want to feed back some of the, those insights to you um, so you understand a little bit more about why they're looking at this um, in the first place, uh, what the emerging opportunities are for farmers to continue to get paid um, for implementing sustainable practices on farm, um, and then a little bit more about how eAgronom is uh, helping to facilitate this. So, there's a few different ways to describe what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, but we're going to start with the basics, and we use the term value chain uh, a lot in the work that I do. Um, the value chain is effectively the, like, the flow of goods um, from production through to end consumer. And when we're talking about a food value chain, um, what we're often looking at... Today, I'm talking to a group of farmers, so we've got you here on this dark pillar. This is where you sit. You sit at the production stage of the value chain. Um, and we talk about it as upstream and downstream. So upstream from you is... Input providers, you might be buying seeds, fertilizers, crop protection products. You also then are likely getting loans, so there's financial institutions that are inputs to you. So they're upstream in the value chain, but you are downstream from them. Uh, and then fl from there, the crops that you produce are flowing. Now, not necessarily every crop value chain has every single one of these steps, but we have, um, you might then first be selling to some sort of aggregator, a place that is collecting crops from your region, um, centralizing them. That may or may not also be a processor, so someone who's transforming it. In the case of wheat, you might be selling to a mill, and that mill is turning that into flour. From there, the commodity is now flour, and so then that's getting traded. Um, these uh, are then um, maybe being traded once, twice, many times um, before flowing through to food brands. So the food brands that are then turning this into a product, a loaf of bread. And of course, at the end of the chain, there's the food retailers, the grocery store, the place where we as consumers go purchase that food. And so this is a, just a, a general overview of what the value chain is. You guys know this better than me, so... Um, but just for, for definition purposes, we thought we'd start with the basics. So these companies, that generally the ones that are downstream from you, um, are really starting to consider emissions from farms. They're really starting to realise that um, this is an important uh, piece of, of their footprint. So just to give a little bit of an understanding for how a, co a corporate looks at their own footprint, um, we start using these words, we use the words scope, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And so um, just to give you a quick, quick lesson in this, um, scope one is the emissions that are being directly burned. So if you are a company and you have cars that are burning petrol, that's scope one. You might also be burning coal to create heat. Uh, that all forms, falls under scope one emissions. Scope two is the electricity that a company is purchasing. Um, so that electricity is being produced at a, at a, might be with coal, with gas, with nuclear, with renewables. Depending on where you are in the world and the grid that you're connected to, uh, that influences the emissions per unit of electricity. So you can't really control it um, directly, but uh, you can also control how much you purchase. So 
That's scope one and scope two. Easy, right? <laughs> then we get to scope three. And scope three is another word that you might hear when uh, companies are rolling out programs that deal with farms because you fall in their scope three. So scope three has upstream on the left. So this is anything upstream of the company. And to simplify, it might be things, it might be the emissions that are involved in the inputs that they're using. It might be the emissions associated with the production of their products. Um, and it can also be the transporting and processing of getting things throughout uh, the chain. Downstream from them, um, we've also got more transport and processing. Um, we've got the use of the product. So um, if, if, you're if, if you've got, a, if you're a fertilizer company, the use of your fertilizers is downstream from you. And when you're trying to capture your emissions footprint, you've got to think about this. Uh, and then of course there's end of life. So when things are getting recycled or put into landfill, are they releasing further emissions there? Now, all of these processes are releasing greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are up the top. Um, the main ones that we hear about is carbon dioxide, CO2. And uh, CO2 is, tends to be the metric that we, uh, we use as um, kind of to interchange and understand equivalents of different, um, uh, different activities. So um, the thing is, is that there's a few other ones that are really important. So we've got methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O, which are very much being produced at farm level. And when we're talking about equivalents, um, when we're converting these back into what is, how, how potent a greenhouse gas are these, um, uh, these gases, the, the methane is actually 28 times worse for global warming than carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide nearly 300 times. So these uh, gases, as they're getting released, are um, caught, having worse effects than... Uh, than carbon dioxide. So what we do is we multiply them to create an equivalence factor. This is all real fun. <laughs> but um, the point is here is that you can see that this production stage in the food value chain, production, um, what you guys are involved in, is a heavy emitter, um, relatively speaking, to the rest of the chain. So I just grabbed an example. It's literally the first one the first company I looked at, I quickly opened them. I looked at their sustainability report because they've gone to the trouble of, uh, of um, trying to uh, account for their footprint and put it in a public-facing report. And you can see that the, uh, the big blue ring, the production, sourcing our ingredients, and you can see it's dairy and livestock, soil and forests, is a whopping nearly three quarters of their footprint. Uh, and this is in scope three. Um, so it's usually upstream and downstream uh, from them. That's what scope three means. And uh, that's the sort of, that's the emission pools that they have the least control over. So they can control how much direct fuel they're burning, how much electricity they're buying, but they can't control a lot of these other steps, including the production. So um, this is why they're suddenly interested. Now that they have to account and report for this and uh, be public facing with this, all of a sudden now they're starting to really think, okay, we've got to tackle this in some way. So what does the farm footprint look like? Um, well, I tried to... Uh, put some pretty icons on a page and show you what this looks like. But um, very quickly, and, and I won't bore you with this because you've heard a little bit about it already. Um, where, where have we got methane coming from? We've got methane coming from livestock. Uh, so the enteric methane, when they burp, they, re they produce methane. Um, so does the, when their waste is um, decomposing, either on field or in a pit. Um, it's also releasing nitrous oxide and methane. Um, when you're burning fossil fuels in, a tr in your uh, farming equipment, 
you're usually producing carbon dioxide. When you're putting fertilizer on your fields, uh, that fertilizer has first already got a, they call it embodied emissions or emissions that upstream from, from, for the, in the production of that fertilizer, but then it's also releasing nitrous oxide as it's sitting on the field. Um, that's direct emissions, but then it's also leaching into the groundwater, running off and releasing more later. Um, of course, there's also opportunities to bring um, gases out of the atmosphere and store them. And this is why farming is uh, particularly unique uh, in terms of its opportunities. So as you're, um, as you're growing your, your crops, your trees, uh, you're pulling CO2 from the atmosphere, we all know this. Um, and then of course you could also be pulling uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere as well uh, by using nitrogen fixing uh, species, particularly as cover crops. Um, and then you're affecting these uh, pools in the, in the soil um, by increasing your soil organic carbon. Of course, you can also be applying organic matter and manures uh, and increasing the nitrogen that's stored in the soil and available to plants as well. So this is kind of a, a footprint. It's a cycle also. These are the cycles that, that are happening at all times. So really it's about what are the opportunities to uh, affect that cycle so that we have more stored and less emitted. Now, the opportunity for farmers. Now, there's, you guys are going to hear about this all day today, so I'm not going to go into this in a big way. But by taking uh, certain steps, trying to reduce fuel, uh, trying to reduce fertilizer application, uh, synthetic fertilizer application, or optimize, sorry, um, reducing the amount of tillage, uh, improving the soil cover, Obviously, there's agronomic benefits um, that we're, you're going to hear about to, uh, much more, and you probably already know way better than me. Um, we can increase soil organic carbon. We can increase the water holding capacity of soils. We can improve the biodiversity and soil health. All of that has benefits to you and to your system. But if you want to get paid for it, you have to be part of a, a program that's monitoring and collecting this data. Um, so some of you are very familiar with the agronom. Um, we're already running carbon programs uh, that are, are implementing a lot of these steps. So not only are we a platform, but we're also running these programs and making and ha feeding in all these other aspects as well. So for starting at the bottom here, uh, the field diary. So understanding the activities that you're implementing on your farm, so that we can say, okay. You've passed your field with a tractor X a number of times. We can understand how much fuel you've used. Um, then we can look at, or we can also understand from that the fertilizer application that's been included at farm, on farm. So then we have soil sampling in the middle there. That's where we go and actually take a sample from your field. Some of you might have been lucky enough to be part of the uh, soil sampling program with, with eAgronom. Um, but uh, we collect those and then we can take another one at a later point in time to understand how much has changed. And then we also have satellite detection as well. So this is more about a quality control uh, to make sure that when we're calculating the emissions that we're being accurate. Um, so if uh, what we can do is instead of just relying on a field diary, we can also go and check from the sky um, the activities that have been declared, uh, we can also try and then use that to reduce the amount of effort it takes to fill out uh, some of the, um, the data collection. Once we've got all of that, we then need to quantify what those emissions are. Um, and they, generally, we, we quantify the methane, the nitrous oxide, the carbon dioxide, turn it into carbon dioxide equivalent, and that's where you can get emission reductions and removals that are... Uh, that can return you some value. Now, I want to clarify a little bit here, because I'm talking about the value chain today specifically, but I want to make a quick cl clarification of um, how the, that the, the there basically are different markets for your emission reduction and removals that you can generate on farm. So in eAgronom's carbon program, these, uh, we're generating 
carbon offsets, carbon credits, you might also hear them as. Um, and these are certificates that when a company has their big, uh, they've done their footprint, they know how many emissions they have, they can go and buy some um, carbon credits and offset like on a financial ledger. The thing is, offset buyers are often different industries. They're often um, clothing and apparel, there's cars, there's aviation, tech, uh, and energy companies. These are a lot of the buyers of carbon credits uh, that are active in the market. And there's a big, big rule, number one rule, in carbon markets, carbon offsetting. Do not double count. So if you are selling emission reductions and removals to these companies, it can be sold once and only once, and then you, basically you're, you're selling the right to the claim, so they now have it. They now can own that emission reduction and removal, which is not very good news for the value chain that's happening down the bottom, or the, the, the value chain that we talked about earlier, the processors, the traders, the food brands, because they are now starting to look at their emissions and realising that, uh, that if you're selling those emissions to someone else, which is good for you, um, then they can't claim them. So the idea then is that they start to engage farmers uh, and we start to change the way we talk about um, the emission uh, reductions. We start to look at the footprint of a product instead of the, the, just the, the reduction or removal that you've made. So if we can then reduce the carbon footprint of the product that's coming off your farms, or if we can reduce the product of wheat, then that can be flowing on. And every single company in this chain, you are in their scope three. So they are all then using lower emission products and, and buying and selling them. Uh, and so the whole value chain can benefit from the reductions and the removals that are happening on farm. So if that's so good, why hasn't it been done yet? Um, the reason being is because the companies that are under the most consumer pressure and the ones that are most willing uh, to pay for the reductions and removals in the value chain are so far away, in many cases, from the farm. So by the time they've received the wheat, in whichever form it's in, they don't know where it's come from. They, don't, they, they might have some relationships where they can ask and say, okay, I know I'm generally sourcing from southern Estonia, but they don't know who you are um, in many cases. So how do we get around that? This is where platforms like eAgronom uh, can help, and this is what we're starting to move uh, and explore into. Basically, if we're in contact with you and we're in contact with them, we can uh, facilitate those, uh, the flow of information in one direction and the flow of payment in the other. Um, and basically, um, that's the idea, uh, but it's still emerging. So I wanted to bring to you today a little bit of a, a status, a pulse check on what's happening now uh, in this space, because um, some of you might have started to receive, um, you know, I know these programs are coming, talking to farmers, you may have received offers from eAgronom, but you may also start to receive offers from companies saying, we've got a program, and they might call it a value chain program, they might call it a scope three program, they might call it an emission reduction program, um, but they've got programs that you might start hearing about. So this is all to give you some context into why, why they're doing this. Um, so some companies have actually started these pilots. Um, they're usually small. Not many people are doing it at scale yet. Uh, but they're starting to run these pilot programs where they are using a select, with a, working with a select group of farmers, getting that information, doing some sort of practice change, um, and then paying them. Um, so that's a really good thing, that they're starting, to, they're starting to work small. We hope, obviously, that they then expand this. Um, I think sometimes 
there's some challenges, um, which is, it's both good and bad, but when a company is specialising in pr certain products, they're often really, they might be really, really interested in the wheat that you grow, but all the other crops that you grow to them, and or that you don't, that you grow on your farm and then sell somewhere else, that's not really in their, um, in their scope. They're not looking at that. They're looking at just the wheat or just, you know, the sugar beet or just one thing. Um, and so that can be a really big challenge for you guys uh, and for running programs because they might be ready to pay for one thing and not pay for the rest. And um, some other companies have also taken um, single intervention approaches as well. So a good example is the fertilizer switching. Um, there's a partnership between uh, PepsiCo and Yara that uh, where basically they're trying to um, help subsidize the cost of the additional, uh, of the green fertilizer, fertilizer that's been produced with green hydrogen um, and then has a lower footprint uh, so it really doesn't, you, your practices are not really changing, um, but they're, they've got a partnership where, uh, where Pepsi subsidises the, um, the cost of that additional, of that green fertiliser uh, and provides that to you. That's a, like a single intervention approach. Um, I think where that is, um, maybe it's good for now, um, and if, it, it, you know, if those programs are offering you a good amount of money, then of course you're going to look at them. Uh, but they're also not capturing the full potential of a farm when we look at that full footprint to be able to reduce um, your, uh, your other emissions and then also look at opportunities for sequestration as well. Um, and then of course companies are just not ready to pay. Some of them are like, oh, we really want to do it, we've mapped our footprint, but... We haven't, um, you know, who's going to pay for this? So we get, we hear that one a lot. They also haven't figured out how to work with the people in their value chain, so the, the suppliers that are supplying them. A lot of them are starting to talk to them now, but it's a real evolution. The programs that do get up, get up for a short amount of time. Companies only committing for three years, so that's a common one as well. Um, and then obviously that single crop focus, which means they're not ready to pay for your full farm effort. So what's the future of this and how are we working to shape that a little bit? So I think there's still a little bit of um, this, this stuff, you know, is a little bit not so interesting to you, but this, the, the certification standards um, which tell us how we need to quantify these emissions are still evolving. So we're hoping that by the end of 2025 or we're expecting that we're going to have a lot more clarity on that and be able to run... Uh, programs in a little bit more of a formal and established way. Um, but uh, we believe that the best case for you is to have programs that are as flexible as possible, where you can capture all the emissions that are happening on your farm and be able to then sell your re reductions and removals to the highest bidder, whoever's paying that year, um, whether that be selling to an offset market, to an in, um, an in setting, isn't that's a, a scope three value chain market, um, or to selling removals to one market and reductions to another. All of these uh, require a bit more flexibility than exists currently, um, but we believe that we have a role to play in that we are actually positioned to capture uh, the full data that's happening on your farm uh, to help make sure that your full farm effort can be uh, rewarded. So uh, that's where we're at in this space. But in the meantime, if you're in the carbon program, the offsetting pathway is, uh, is very much underway. So um, key takeaways, multiple ways to get paid, all are good. Um, choose what's best for you. But at least now you have a little bit more insight into what uh, some of the drivers are behind each program. Um, the opportunities for you to get paid are increasing. That's a great thing. Um, and oh, the hardest part about all of this is the data collection. So um, if you're not getting your farm uh, data collected and monitored, then 
no payments will be made. Um, and then last but not least, that we're working with the leading standards to make sure that this gets done fast and right. So, um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Ah, so uh, the, qu the, the question was that um, if uh, we have so much data, how much does the uh, war industry or? How much does the what, sorry? Mis see olid, kui palju ostab neid andmeid või? Ah, so. Yeah, so how much does a, um, how do you call it, mil mil military industry or war industry buy oh. any credits? Um, so you're asking if the if if the if that industry is a buyer of the kas, offsets? Küsid, et kas sõjatööstus on nagu krediitide ostja siis või? Ja, ja. Ja, as far as I'm aware, um, the partners that we work with to sell your credits that are generated do not sell to that industry. Um, so I, I know that that's a difficult, uh, it's a sensitive topic, but um, I, I'm, I'm very confident that they're not being sold to that industry. So we take it, yeah. Side step. Follow up question. Have we ever calculated how much does a drone explosion emit CO2? <laughs> Not me personally, um, <laughs> but uh, there would there are emissions associated with war, and um, I, d I can't tackle that problem today. I'm afraid. 